is the new Himalayan 450 and it's a bike I really don't need to introduce to you and that's mainly for two reasons. The first is that it's one of the most anticipated motorcycles of recent times and the second is that Royal Enfield has done a tremendous job of already showing the bike to the world. I suppose the big question that remains to be answered is what's it like to ride? And to begin, we have to talk about the elephant in the room, that new motor. It's called the Sherpa 450 and it is completely new and the most advanced, most modern engine Royal Enfield has ever made. Here are some of the things that are new on this engine that Royal Enfield has never done before. Starting from the top, we have ride-by-wire. A little further down, we have double overhead camshafts. It's a 452cc engine. It has an 11.5 compression ratio, which is a lot higher than the old Himalayan 411, which was about 9.5, if I remember right. Going into the engine, we have an aluminium bore. We have a forged piston. And this is actually now a slightly short stroke engine. The bore is now a little bigger than the stroke. That is all very different for Royal Enfield and the result is a very different feeling engine, starting with the way it sounds. As you can see, this is no longer a slow revving engine and it no longer thumps. Clearly, this is going to be a very different experience, but Royal Enfield tells us they've really tried hard to retain the character and the essence of the old Himalayan. And you will see that there's a duality to this engine when you study the power and torque curves. For the torque, you will get 90% of all that torque at just 3000 RPM, and the peak figure is at about 5000 RPM. However, peak power comes in at 8000 RPM, which gives this bike a different sense of character when you rev it out. This is a motor that likes to be revved out. There is a good amount of performance available up top. But at the same time, it's also a tractable engine. If you study the torque curve, you'll see it's a very fat, well spread out torque curve and it's available right through the rev range. That meaty torque spread bears out in reality as well, but only above 3000 RPM. Anything below that and the engine felt quite gutless. To be fair, we were at about 10,000 feet in altitude and steep uphills in this region are never ending. There will certainly be some improvement in performance at sea level, but how much remains to be seen. For now, this engine feels soft at the low end and while it certainly doesn't have that strong low down effortlessness of the existing Himalayan 411, it is vastly stronger everywhere else and it won't stall on you easily either. In fact, you can just ease the clutch out at idle and the bike smoothly moves forward without any throttle inputs and that should be nice and slow moving traffic. When you cross the 5000 RPM mark, that's when you feel a real step in when that peak torque arrives. And if you keep it pinned, it starts to surge, you get a really nice intake sound and that eggs you on into revving it all the way to the 8500 RPM limiter. And it's surprisingly good fun to ride that way. The nice thing about this engine is that it allows you to chill if you want to, but it also encourages you to ride hard if you feel like. What's also new is that Royal Enfield has now given this bike riding modes. There are effectively two modes, Eco and Performance. Eco mode caps the power and we didn't really use it up here very much. But even in Performance mode, the throttle response is beautifully smooth and very well judged. That being said, even in Performance mode, the throttle action is a little too mellow in the first few degrees of rotation. If you're riding fast, whether on road or off it, it would be nice to have a more direct acting throttle map. And this is something that Royal Enfield could do because this bike already has ride-by-wire and riding modes. Nevertheless, this is an extremely friendly bike to ride and the power delivery always feels smooth and easy to predict. Speaking of power delivery, it certainly doesn't have the top-end rush and the aggression of the KTM motor and it also doesn't have that hard-hitting, sudden torque that arrives on the Triumph motor about 3000 RPM. This is all much nicely spread out. Overall, in terms of performance, I think it might be a little slower than the Triumph because it's carrying more weight, but I expect that you should get a 0-100 to time maybe about 7 seconds. 
Royal Enfield tells us that the top speed is above 150 kph and while we certainly couldn't test that on these sort of roads, what we could see was that 100 kph in 6th gear is at just 5000 rpm. That suggests that a cruising speed of about 120 kph or more should be quite possible, but it's something we'll be looking out for when we get to ride the bike at home base. Now this engine does have some vibrations. They're nicely managed, you'll feel them at different areas at different points and they never really stood out or annoyed me. But if you try and look for them, you will find them. Royal Enfield has done some things to try and address this. The foot peg mounts themselves have some vibration absorbing dampers. The foot pegs don't feel squishy, but that does absorb some vibration. Then you also have these rubbers on the pegs. They're soft, which absorbs more vibration. And when you stand on the pegs to ride off-road, they compress and give you a little more grip. But if you want to take them off, you will have to unbolt them and they're not just the push plug type system. And that leaves us with the transmission. Now, Royal Enfield has been making some very good gearboxes in the recent years and this one is too smooth, precise, no false shifts, no false neutrals, really quite nice. I also really like the clutch. The feel is good, it's not too heavy, the bite point is really nice to gauge and overall, I think this is one of the nicest Royal Enfield clutches that I've experienced so far. So that's the story with this new engine. It's happy to chill if you want, but it also likes to go fast and it will make sure you have a good time. And that brings us on to the next very impressive aspect on this motorcycle, and that's the new chassis. This is a brand new steel twin spar frame and it uses the engine as a stressed member, which has removed the need for a lower cradle. The airbox has now been moved under the fuel tank right behind the headstock while a differently positioned rear shock linkage has liberated even more ground clearance. Wheel sizes are still 21 inches at the front and 17 inches at the rear, but the rear tyre is now a wider unit. The suspension is also new, now with a nice chunky 43mm USD fork and the brakes are bigger at both ends as well, which is something that the old Himalayan really needed. I think the chassis has proven to be my favourite aspect of this motorcycle. On the road, the handling is so good, it's surprisingly good. We've been throwing it around corners, high lean angles, no sense of doubt in the motorcycle. It really holds a line, it doesn't feel heavy. It hides the fact that it has a 21 inch wheel so well. In fact, you'll only be aware of that when you're trying to change direction from one side to the other, you need to put some effort into the bars. But as a handling motorcycle, this is really good. Complementing the handling are the new brakes. They're much stronger than the old Himalayan. That was a problem on the old bike, no longer here. Again, like the rest of this motorcycle, they're not overtly sharp, they're not aggressive, but they're very good. They stop the bike well and they have good feel. Special mention must also go to the new Seat tyres. They've been co-developed with Royal Enfield for this bike and they are surprisingly good. There were no complaints on the road, even at high lean angles on cold tarmac and they did a really good job of finding grip in the dry off-road riding conditions that we experienced. Then again, it's the chassis that really makes a difference off-road. First of all, this feels like a long motorcycle. The wheelbase has gone up compared to the old Himalayan by quite a bit. And it has a lovely stable feel. Now yesterday we were riding in a fast group of people, lots of dust, I couldn't really see where I was going. Sometimes you hit a big bump, but the motorcycle absorbs that sudden impact really well. Handlebar gets a bit of a shake and you feel the whole bike just take it in and smooth out. It's a great feeling knowing that the bike is so trustworthy, you can hit loose rocks and not worry too much. The really impressive part though is this new Showa suspension. It's 200mm of travel in the front and 200mm at the rear. The front is the same as the old Himalayan, the rear is a little bit more now. Non-adjustable except for preload at the back, but the setting is fabulous. Not too soft, you don't have excessive dive on the road, but also not so firm. It deals with potholes amazingly well. When we first started riding the bike, you see these nasty potholes on the road and you go, oh god, that's going to be bad, but it just sails right through. And the same thing applies off-road great sense of composure and a great sense of confidence for you as a rider. To me, this is undoubtedly the best suspension that you will get on any off-road capable motorcycle in India at this price point.
I really enjoyed riding this bike off road. Now we've already talked about the stability and the trustworthiness of it, but there is an overwhelming aspect of this being a solid motorcycle. You feel like it can take a drop if you do. No worries over there. Hit something hard, it'll take it. You can carry some pretty high speeds on off road sections. There were times when you saw 90, 100 in third gear flat out on rocky roads. Great fun. At the same time, this is a Himalayan, so it's not a highly sporty, aggressive thing. Up here, the altitude has robbed some power, so if you want to pass slide it, you need to provoke it a little bit. But again, when it slides, it feels beautifully controlled with the length of the chassis. When you jump it, the suspension takes it really nicely. I enjoyed riding it off-road, both from a point of attacking a trail, but also from an aspect of, I see a bad road, come on, bring it on, let's do this, no worries. There's no stress of riding on any sort of road condition with this bike. A couple more details worth mentioning are that the rear ABS can be deactivated in either riding mode for when you want to ride off-road. And if you do so, the front ABS also changes to a less intrusive setting. And finally, with 230mm of ground clearance, clearing obstacles is no issue and the main stand no longer clatters and clangs off-road like it used to on the old bike. Another aspect that many of us liked was the seating position and for me, this was a noticeable improvement over the old Himalayan. If you're someone tall, there's plenty of room for your knee. On the old Himalayan, my knee would foul on that tank extension. It didn't feel so nice. No such problems over here. Very roomy seat. You want to move forward, you want to move back. Lots of room. The handlebar is set at a very comfortable riding position for the road. And if you stand up, it's really not so bad off-road either. Tall riders may want a bit of a riser, but I sort of like this. You lean down a bit, get some weight over the front end, and that gives you more feel. Now, the clever thing here is that the seats are height adjustable as standard. Standard seat height is 825 mm, but you can pull the seat off and there are these simple little adjustments underneath that let you raise it by 20 mm. I've been riding the high position, but I don't find it too tall. And to give you an idea of what it's like, here's Kumel, he's 5'9". Let's see what he looks like on the motorcycle with the seat in the high position. Slightly on tiptoes, Kumel. It is off-road right now, but he's been riding the bike in this seat position all day long and he hasn't had a problem. With that being said, Kumel did eventually end up preferring the bike in the lower 825mm seat setting. And in that sense, this new Himalayan is a little less friendly than its predecessor. Even though the weight is slightly less than before, this still feels like a bigger bike than the old Himalayan and at 196 kgs, it's still a good chunk heavier than the KTM 390 Adventure or the Triumph Scrambler 400X. The good news is that Royal Enfield will sell you an accessory seat with less cushioning that brings the seat height down to 805mm. Riders shorter than 5 feet 8 inches will probably prefer this lower seat. Now you've already seen plenty of this motorcycle on the internet, so I'm not going to go too much into the overall design, but I will talk about the things that I like. The round headlamp is probably the most recognizable, familiar aspect of this motorcycle. It is essentially what you get on the Super Meteor, but with a different mounting at the back. This windscreen does a nice job. We have to see what it's like on the highway, but out here it was really quite nice. You will get a higher version as an accessory if you wish. Front fender looks good and these nice chunky fork protectors look good as well. You do have a conventional mudguard out here which will give you protection, it won't let the bike get too filthy, that's a nice practical aspect. And the radiator is protected nicely as well. Royal Enfield gives you this little guard as standard so you would probably need to buy a radiator guard as an accessory. Underneath you have a small metal guard here for the header pipe. This is plastic and you can buy an aluminium one as an accessory if you wish. Further back, the typical Royal Enfield tank guard, it looks nice over here, lots of mounting points which I like. Up here, you've got standard non-adjustable levers. They do look good, but I would like some adjustability because there were times when I was standing up and riding and I wish the lever was a little closer. Further back, there is new switch gear. This is nice looking stuff. It's inspired by what came on the J-Series bikes, but with a different pattern. You have hazard lights out here. You have a mode switch out here for the modes. And there's a toggle button on the other end. This button allows you to access various menus within the TFT display and speaking of, 
This is a 4-inch round TFT display. Royal Enfield says it's the world's first round TFT display which integrates Google Maps. We're in an area without network right now, so I can't show you the map. We'll overlay some footage. But essentially, you use Royal Enfield's phone app, which uses Google Maps data, and it projects the map onto the screen. That's a wonderful feature because you don't need to mount your phone there anymore. There are a few things to consider though. This display doesn't have any 4G SIM, nothing like that. All the information comes from your phone. Now, essentially your phone is broadcasting via Wi-Fi. It is streaming data. It's pulling off Google Maps data. So if you keep that full map running for a long time, it drains the phone's battery quite fast and you'll want to keep the battery on charge. There is a little USB type C charger out here, but if you don't want to keep your phone exposed, you can just keep it in your bag with a power bank. The new TFT will also support things like call information and music, but the number of apps supported is limited if you're connected via an iOS device. Still, this is a very functional sort of feature and it should be appreciated by people who like to go on tour. It also compensates for the fact that the Himalayan otherwise keeps it quite simple in terms of features and you won't get things like traction control or a quick shifter. This is my favorite aspect of the design. I love the look of this fuel tank. It serves two functions. Out here, it's nice and narrow, which lets you get your feet down very comfortably. But up here, it's really wide. When you look at it, you feel like you're on a bigger bike than this actually is. It also holds 17 liters of fuel, which is better than its competition. And Royal Enfield says that this bike could have well over 400 kilometers of range, depending on how you ride. For the back, things get simpler. It's the way of adventure bikes. The front is the stylish part. The rear is the more utilitarian part. You have a nice tough grab handle here. It says max load 5 kilos, which is quite low. It will take more weight than that. But for now, this says 5 kilos max load. Finally, you have no brake lamp. The brakes are integrated into the indicators, like so. It's a clean looking system. And this section does remind me quite a bit of the Hunter. Another aspect I really like is that the exhaust is really small and slim. The collector box underneath there is doing a bulk of the work. And that let Royal Enfield have a nice stylish unit at the back. At this point, you're probably wondering about the wheels. Royal Enfield will in fact be the very first Indian manufacturer to offer cross-spoked wheels that support tubeless tyres. However, these rims are still awaiting BIS homologation, so for now, they're only available on the export motorcycles. Hopefully, they will eventually be available in India, either on a top variant or as an accessory. Speaking of variants, there is only one fully specced motorcycle for India, and it's available in five different colour patterns. Quality levels in general are now at the high standard that Royal Enfield has been achieving off late. And this bike also has some nice details like that new forged side stand. Finish levels are good too, but when you examine the smaller details like the bolts and fasteners used, it's not quite at the level of the new Triumphs. There's also a big range of well-designed accessories, including touring seats, hand guards, luggage, crash bars and more. Royal Enfield even has a cool looking rally variant planned with a flat bench seat and a more racy looking tail section. However, you can't purchase these parts as accessories and you will have to spec the bike with them at the time of purchase through Royal Enfield's online MIY configurator. The last two days with this bike have been really wonderful. There is something romantic about riding a bike called the Himalayan in the land of the Himalayas and it has really excelled out here. Yes, it still needs to prove itself in the real world, but I have really enjoyed riding this bike so far and I am optimistic. The new Himalayan will replace the old 411 and that may upset some purists. In my opinion, Royal Enfield has had the biggest turnaround of any automotive manufacturer in the last 10 years and they have truly earned the right to start making modern and exciting motorcycles like this, but ones that also retain their essence of pure motorcycling. Those who still want the old school RE experience can buy the Scram 411 or the J series bikes because they will remain on sale for the long term. When it comes to the question of character, does this bike have the character of the old bikes? Well, if you define character by sound and a thumping engine, no, this is the least characterful motorcycle Royal Enfield has ever made. But I like to define character as a bike that speaks to me. Do I think about it after I've ridden it? Do I miss riding it? Do I want to ride it? And the Himalayan does tick those boxes. So to me, this motorcycle does have a sense of character of its own. Finally, there is the question of price. 
Royal Enfield will be revealing the price at the Rider Mania Festival later this month. They haven't told us what it is, but we can make a few assumptions. The first assumption is that a 450 single cannot be more expensive than a 650 parallel twin, which means that this will be below 3 lakh rupees. The second assumption is that I don't think Royal Enfield is going to go crazy with aggressive pricing like the Triumph Speed 400. Don't expect something that crazy low. However, the Himalayan does cost a fair amount less, just above 2 lakh rupees, and it shouldn't be a very big step over the old motorcycle. My assumption 2.5 to 2.7 lakh rupees, we shall see. But if Royal Enfield is sensible with the pricing, this bike is a winner.